Good afternoon. Let's call today's Board of Trustees meeting to order at 4.03 p.m. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. Bilkowski. Present. Epic. McDemy. Present. Nunley. Present. Sheets. Here. Stanger. Swanson. Here. Zibble. Here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I would ask that before we get into the meeting, if we could have a uh, moment of silence for Trustee Pijmo, who passed away. Thank you, everyone. If we could please stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Mr. Zibel, would you please read the mission statement? Uh, certainly. Lake Tran is committed to providing quality public transportation services to all Lake County residents with special emphasis on meeting the transportation needs of seniors and people with disabilities. Thank you very much. Are there any public comments in the room today? Seeing none. Our first agenda item is the approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the Lake Tran Board of Trustees strategic planning retreat minutes of September 25th, 2023? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Zibble. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Swanson. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. McDemy? Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Is there a motion to approve the Lake Tran Board of Trustees board meeting minutes of September 25th, 2023? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Zibble. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Swanson. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. Abstain. Yes. Zibble. Yes. Yes. Thank you, everyone. At this time, is there a motion to enter into executive session to consider the employment, promotion, or compensation of a public employee or official pursuant to section 121.22 G1 of the Ohio Revised Code? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Swanson. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Nunnally. Judy, if you could please call the roll. Mac to me. Yes. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Okay, thank you. At this time, the, at 4.06 p.m., the board's going to enter into executive session. We're going to invite our legal counsel, Mr. Dines, and our CEO, Mr. Capel, to stay with us. For our YouTube viewers, we will be back on YouTube at the conclusion of executive session. Okay, let's resume today's Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, at this time, it looks like I'm going to turn the meeting over to Ben for a presentation on same-day dial arrives. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Um, this was an intention to be a follow-up of the conversation we had at the strategic uh, planning retreat. Um, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. If you have questions, let me know. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit more overview of what same-day dial ride is, some of the metrics that go with it. Um, so what we have talked about internally of doing is running at the same hours as dial ride. So Friday, five to nine, Saturday, eight to seven. Um, it would be segregated operationally from traditional dial ride service. There would be buses that just do same day dial ride. When they leave the garage in the morning, there would be no trips assigned to them. They would just go out into the wild and wait for people to schedule trips via the app. The other dial ride buses would exist in their normal mode, pre-scheduled service, just like always. We would use a mobile app to schedule it. For those of you that read at APTA, you got to see a demo of it. Um, on the second day, we really stayed with the vendor and got into the details. The app is actually in production. I didn't realize when I talked to you in September that it was in a state that it was, it was being used by a transit system. It was out in the wild. It wasn't sort of a concept. It is a thing that exists that is actively being used today which makes me feel really good. You know, I, I thought we were gonna have to wait or have to develop something, which I didn't wanna do. So that was a really good, uh, a good thing to see. Um, generally, what we are thinking is we should plan on same day dial ride being less efficient than traditional dial ride to start out. The reason is when 
the trips are planned ahead of time, our schedulers sit and they really maximize the efficiency. They sit down, they organize all the trips, they make sure they make sense, they're happening in the most logical order possible. With trips getting booked sort of last minute, there's less opportunity to review them and make sure they're scheduled efficiently. I'll get into what might be a counterpoint to that in a, in a second, but we wanted to approach it conservatively, assuming that it would be a little bit less efficient than regular dial a ride. Um, Define well, less efficient. I'll get, I'll, 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 I'll hit that right here. What we think is the best way to do it is we would begin it with 12 full-time drivers. What that actually means is 10 on the road at any given time with two backups. Um, when we look at our driver system across the board, um, on average, to have 10 people on the road, you need 2.1 people behind the scenes ready to fill vacancies. That's how often people call off nowadays. It does seem like a lot, but to guarantee 12 people on the road every day, I'm sorry, 10 people on the road every day, you need two to fill in for them. Our average today, the average full-time driver does 14 trips per an eight-hour shift. Um, that means that if we had 10 people on the road and efficiency stayed exactly the same as our current dial ride, we would be able to do 140 same day trips every single day. Now, we think efficiency productivity is going to go down because they won't be scheduled as efficiently as booked in advance trips. So if, if productivity went down by 10%, we'd be able to do 126 trips. Now, the caveat that we talked about internally is we suspect that same day trips will likely be shorter in distance because when you're thinking about a same day trip, if you're going to the store, you know, you're not taking a cross county trip to go to the store. You're not going to go from Madison to Wycliffe to go to the grocery store or make a quick trip. So it's also possible that efficiency could go up if all of the trips are short distance within your community. We tried to find out from other transit systems what they had experienced. There really isn't an apples to apples comparison for us. A lot of the people that are doing same day service like this confine it to a very restricted area. And it is there with the intention of sort of replacing fixed route service. It's not the model that we're talking about. We're talking about same day dial ride being countywide, just like regular dial ride. We've not yet found anybody doing that exact same thing. So we couldn't find anybody to compare ourselves to. Some of the people that do, you know, the industry term for this is micro transit. Some of the folks that do that have reported very high trips per hour. Um, Coda has a very high trips per hour example in the um, uh, Rickenbacker Airport area. That is a substitute for fixed route service. So it's possible that it could be more efficient. We really won't know specifically until we put it on the road, which is why we wanted to come at it with a more conservative approach of saying we think it's going to be less efficient. If it's more efficient, that's great. But we, we, there's no good metric to, to figure that out at the moment. And there's no peer for us to compare ourselves to. But this gives you an idea of what we would be proposing. Ben, isn't this a direct competition with Lyft and uh, what's the other one? Uber. Uber, yeah. Um, a little bit. No, but not a little bit. It's the same thing. Well, uh, Uber and Lyft don't have uh, great coverage in Lake County. There aren't always trips available. Um, their vehicles are not accessible to the general public. So if Lyft and Uber were out here with any regularity and were reliable, it would be a little bit more of a competition. But as we learned in some previous experiences, Lake County is a secondary market to Cleveland. Cleveland is a secondary market for Uber and Lyft. They just aren't focused on Lake County service. And so it's not reliable. It does exist out here, but it's not reliable every day of the week. If you've ever tried to use it, it just it's just not reliable. Some days it does exist. Some days it doesn't. It, it just varies. Ben, this is sure. um, with current dial ride uh, assistance capabilities, correct? Yes, this would be able, This we're required to do that. This would be fully accessible for uh, anyone with any kind of disability, same as regular dial ride. Um, because the software was further along than uh, we thought, I thought I would throw in here what the costs were. Um, this is a, a what they call a budget quote. We would have to get a sort of an official quote, but this is your order of magnitude. Um, there would be a one-time license fee of $72,000, a one-time implementation fee of $20,000, 
and the annual fee would be $15,000, which would likely go up about 3% a year. Um, one of the things I know is a big concern for, for us internally and for the board is, you know, if we, if we do this using one time money, are we, are we getting ourselves in trouble operating something that could exist for a long time with one time money? And I had a hard time explaining in my head uh, why I don't think that's a big issue. And so I, I tried uh, this time with some graphics. We'll see if it works. <laughs> so when you think about the efficiency and, and the trip demand for traditional dial ride and same day dial ride, today, all of our capacity is on traditional dial ride. We want our capacity to match what's requested of us as closely as possible. We saw last October when it got out of whack, how it upsets people, but today we are keeping this balanced really well. What we expect to happen with same day dial ride is for slowly for some of those trips to move from traditional dial ride to same day dial ride. We don't expect a lot of this to be new trips. We don't expect people to come out of the woodwork um, and use this service differently than what they're currently doing. They're just gonna schedule it differently. And so over time, we're gonna see more of those people move from traditional dial ride to same day dial ride. But as that happens, as we understand it better and are able to manage the schedule better, we will start to consolidate and organize things better so that over time, it's not necessarily all new service, it's a movement of people between two services. And if we see same day dial ride getting very busy, traditional dial ride getting less busy, we will just move resources. It's in this interim period where you need the extra resources. So again, look at the blue bar, they're the same size right now. As we're understanding how this works, we need all those people on the road to really grasp exactly what they're gonna be doing. But over time, as we understand the demand and things level off, what we would expect to do is balance those resources out to match each other so that there isn't a long-term ongoing additional cost. But we need it in the short term to get everything balanced. So what we think will happen is after three to five years of fully understanding it, we'll be able to level things out. And the extra capacity that we buy right now, that 140 or 126 trips, would not be a long-term expense. That expense would reduce af after time as these things sort of settle out. Um, we have plenty of, we would, we would make sure we have plenty of time to keep those resources in balance. Um, you know, if it is less efficient, there may be some incremental costs. If it's more efficient, we could see costs go down. It's just really hard to know what that will be over time. The other thing that I think is really important is that when we think about this service compared to regular dial ride and the challenges we had in October, the challenges we had in October were really bad because they were, it affected existing customers using our existing service for work and their existing needs. This being a new service, we shouldn't be afraid to say it has a cap and has a limit. And as people use it, if we reach that cap, we shouldn't be afraid to say, we've reached our limit. We're not going to put more on the road. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's, and so it's a little different than, than what happened before, because that was affecting an existing customer base. This being a different service, if there's not enough capacity, there's just not enough capacity. And to some extent, that's not a bad thing because then you make people schedule in advance, which is what we prefer anyway. So you sort of incentivize them to schedule in advance because they know they can get the trip. So I just wanted to follow up. I think that same day dial ride is a really important thing for us to consider in the future. I think this is where the world is going. This is where people are going. They want things now. You know, look at Amazon, look at all the different things in the world. They want their services now. I really feel passionate that this is a direction that we need to go to really continue to stay uh, relevant and important to the lives of the people we serve. And the current generation of seniors that we have, a lot of them grew up with transit. They understand waiting for a bus. That's something they did as a little kid. A lot of them have stories. Oh, I used to ride RTA here. I used to do this here. I used to do this here. The generation of seniors that's starting to use us now 
that's just dipping their toe into the Lake Tran water. They didn't have that experience. They were used to having a car and getting everything. When they walk out of their door, they could go where they want to go. That's what they're going to be expecting from us when they start to engage with us in their 80s. And so I think this is something that is really important for us to work on uh, going forward. So I did put together a little bit of an aggressive schedule, um, depending on how uh, the board was feeling. We are in the tail end of creating a survey for the customers that will go out probably towards the end of this month to be able to get the customer's voice included in this process. Um, we will uh, have sort of a segregated budget of, for this to go with the 2024 budget. Um, and if we moved as quickly as possible, which we would be to put this in the 2024 budget, we could probably implement the software um, between April and August, hire the drivers in June, and have the service on the road in September of 2024. This is sort of a keep in mind, Lake Tran is like steering an oil tanker. The things you do today take a long time to uh, propagate themselves into the future. And so even if we moved as fast as possible, we wouldn't even be able to launch the service until September. So again, not asking for any decisions tonight, just wanted to give you an overview of what we thought. We'll have some more data for you next month. Um, but I really thought it was important to hit this particular service item um, and kind of keep some momentum on it. The other three, I think we're gonna kind of work on in the background, but not as aggressively. I think this is a really important thing for us to do. The other three are, are Great services. I don't think they carry the weight that same day dial a ride does for the future of our customers. And so I'd love to talk to you all about this one on one more, along with the topics we talked about in an executive session, just to see, you know, if there's questions you have, what your thoughts are, or how you just kind of feel about it in general um, going forward. So I know we've been busy tonight, so I try to go quick. I don't know if anybody has any questions uh, for any of that, but uh, yeah. I got, I got a couple. Sure. We are going to um, have dedicated drivers for this. Yes. Are you also going to have dedicated customer service and dispatchers? We would probably have to have, we talked about having two part-time customer service folks that would handle uh, same day trips and have a segregated phone number for them. Um, there is not a need to have separate dispatchers. How will that work to keep track of the same day service and the regular dial ride service? When we look at the workload the current dispatchers have, this is within the realm of their capabilities because it's really, it's five buses in the morning, it's five buses at night. That is not outside of what they can handle. Um, so even within the base of dispatchers you have right now, I'm not asking if you would hire more, but would they be dedicated to watching the same day service literally on their screens as opposed to everybody being responsible for everything? We would probably make some adjustments to the dispatcher's work assignments, but they're, they're just, the number of vehicles at one time just doesn't warrant extra dispatch staff. They have the capacity to handle this, but they are, they do have individual work assignments. And so those would be adjusted a little bit, but will they, will a dispatcher be sitting and staring at the same day screen every minute of every day? No. Well, that's the crux of what I was getting at. Not necessarily increasing the number of dispatchers, but to use your phraseology, the work assignments would probably change. Yeah, we would have to make some adjustments to make sure they were monitoring what was going on. Okay. We have the buses to do this and already on, on we would, the fleet. We would likely have to buy some more. It would depend on what we do with the minivans that are coming into service. Okay. Um, then is there any restrictions on location so that they could be dispatched to or take people to? It would need to be within Lake County, but the any other restrictions than that would be up to us to set. Um, I don't think we would set any to begin with. We talked about some loose locations for the buses as having two on the, the west end, two in the Manor Painesville area, and one in the east, but that's also going to vary based on 
where the demand is. And I, I guess my question was kind of somebody called up and said, I got to get down to the clinic or I got to get down to the UH. Is oh, that, no. That, that would not be. Restricted. No, these, they would be, that's a good question. I should have talked about a little bit. These would be Lake County only trips. If you wanted to go to UH or one of our, our longer destinations, you call and you plan that ahead. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. At this time, I'll turn the meeting over to Lisa for the financial statements. Okay. So we're reporting on August of 2023. Um, I'm going to focus on the middle column. We're at about 20, sorry, we're, yeah. We're at about 21.5 million almost in revenue. Um, our expenses year to date are at like 14.2 and our estimated capital expense that we've spent so far this year, just our local share is at about almost 1.3. And you're gonna see that go up a little bit more with the construction. Um, netting us an income of about almost $6 million. Um, again, I want to highlight if we compare 2022 when we were still getting some of those grants, versus our budget, we're kind of right in the middle of that. We're a little bit more on the revenue side than what we budgeted, um, but operational expenses is kind of like right in the middle. So I, there's nothing that stands out. There's nothing out of the ordinary still through August of 2023. Everything's kind of going smooth just as we planned. And so this kind of gives you a little bit more of the detail. So out of our 21.4 million in revenue, we have about 2.5 is our fares and miscellaneous. Um, our sales tax is at about 6.2, um, just slightly over what we had budgeted and just slightly a couple thousand dollars, or, well, about $600,000 more than what we had in 22. And then obviously, if you look at the federal and state piece, um, we're pretty on target, just a hair over. But if you compare it to 22, you can see where we were getting those grants um, for the pandemic. If we move down on that middle column, still 2023 actual kind of breaks out for you what our expenses are based on wages and benefits, services and software. And we're kind of right in between 2022 and what the budget is. So we're, we're but we're under budget where we said we would be. So we said we'd be at about 16.1, we're at about 14.2. And part of that is because of the hiring. Um, we budgeted for that and, you know, just based on, uh, hiring and being able to hire people when they start and stuff. So other than that, if there's no questions, any questions on that? It's kind of nothing out of the ordinary. Okay, so here's our August uh, cash balance um, that Ben and Gary worked on, kind of give you an idea of the total cash for Lake Tran, STS, and Giaga, and um, the committed funds being the operating reserve, uh, the local share of the board approved projects and contracts for Geauga and Lake Tran. We obviously don't have that in STS because um, anything dealing with capital would belong to Lake Tran. So it's all, it would all be under there if we had anything. Uh, local share of grant commitments. Um, and then at the bottom is our uncommitted funds, but kind of in the capital plan through 2027, which then gives you your undesignated cash. And again, the detail for this um, is on the capital piece that's in the board packet with my financial report that Andrea has supplied for us. Is this okay? All right. Go to the next one. Okay. Oops. So. Okay, so this will be our STS. Um, again, if you go down the middle for our actual, we're close to 70,000 in revenue. Um, our operating expense is at about 142. But again, if you look at 2022, it's a little bit less. Again, we were still feeling the effects of that pandemic. Um, we're a little bit more on the expense side year to date for the uh, STS. Um, we'll have to watch that and make sure because our budget was 200 in revenue and 200 in expenses. So, but we're on target. And then usually summer is a little bit busier with STS. We have more travels. And then again, kind of breaks it out by the fares. 
Um, again, we did increase the fares uh, kind of starting around May or June. So um, those are in here for a couple months, uh, but we'll probably see more of that towards the end of the year. Uh, on the expense side, again, service industry. So most of your expenses are gonna be wages and benefits, obviously. And that's kind of where we're just a little bit over that and on the supplies, but I think that also falls under um, some of the parts and stuff like that that we had to buy for the buses. And then um, if there's no questions on STS, I'll move into the Geauga Transit. Um, total operating revenue. On here, I have nothing for 22 because I don't have any data to... Um, to put on there for that for this year. Uh, but the budget, we were at 862 in revenue. Um, operating expenses are around 450. Uh, the reason why we are higher on the actual end is due to that sub, uh, the grant that we got to help with the merger going in. And that money was provided up front, the 300,000. Uh, so that's why that's a little bit higher. And then the operating expenses are just slightly under what was originally budgeted. And then if we go to the Detail. Yep. Oops. Um, you're anticipating the expenses will go up a little bit as the integration continues. I do. I do. And the reason being is because I know they started also hiring a little bit because she was on the low end when we kind of merged with the staffing. And so, plus, I know we've been working with them also on the Medicaid. And so their Medicaid trips and stuff for Giaga are increasing on their end. Um, they actually have uh, for their for their MRDD, like we we have we have our MRDD and we have the the Medicaid, uh, not net, but the Medicaid uh, money through the state, and they pay for people who are eligible and who are qualified based on circumstances. But the Giaga DD, they if the person is not like qualified through the state, they're still willing to pay that extra, you know, at the higher rate. So that's really a great benefit for them to be able to generate revenue for for Giaga. And so we're just in the midst of that. So hopefully next year um, that should help in their revenue side, bringing, bringing that in a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So for example, um, in the first half of 2023, they brought in about $50,000 of Medicaid revenue in uh, Q3 of this year under us, their Medicaid revenue was about 38,000. So there's been a pretty significant increase in Medicaid revenue just being under our billing structure. So we expect when you see the budget next year, uh, next month, it reflects that along with some additional expenses to go with it. Cool. Thanks. And then the final, this is just a little bit more breakout for them based on their fares and miscellaneous and then their federal and state. And of course, the majority of theirs is going to be federal and state. They get their... Um, the state money at a hundred percent and then federal money obviously is with a local match. So, and it kind of breaks out where the wages and benefits and services and software and stuff. And again, their service industry too. So wages and benefits is always going to be higher for them as well. Any Thank questions you. or comments for Lisa? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the August 2023 Lake Tran STS and Geauga operating financial statements subject to audit and capital plan review? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Zibble. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. McNamee. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. McNamee? Yeah. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It looks like we are going to now talk about um, updates to the Lake Tran Policy Manual. Good evening, everybody. So this is a routine update. I know we just reviewed this in June, and that was for the addition of Geauga Transit. Now it's time to do another update because we just had the passage of the collective bargaining agreement. And these, there's also a couple of little miscellaneous updates that reflect changes into processes and for clarification purposes. I've given a chart. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, that does make a big difference when you're closer, doesn't it? Um, so I've given you a chart with all of the updates that have been made to the policy manual. 
And in Govenda, the uh, policy manual, a draft copy was up uh, uploaded as well as the complete uh, manual with all the updates. So are there any questions to the updates to the policy manual? Thank you. Are there any questions for Emily regarding the policy manual? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve resolution 2023-025 authorizing the CEO or his designee to update the Lake Tran policy manual? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Zibble. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. McNamee. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. McNamee? Yes. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Thank you, everyone. We will now be discussing purchasing six replacement Dialeride vehicles for Geauga Transit. Hello, everyone. Um, we are looking to purchase six replacement Dialeride vehicles with the propane. So it was a grant in, in connection with um, Lake Tran to apply for the low no, and it would be six gasoline vehicles replaced with six propane vehicles at no cost to Geauga Transit. Um, so the federal share is 920,000 and the state share is 230,000, which would cover the cost of six buses. And then we would logo them like the rest of our buses, except for they would have the propane logo on the back of it, saying that they were eco-friendly. Yeah, so the reason, the reason we have this picture in here is I don't think you have seen this. This is the rebranded Geauga Transit vehicle. Um, so this is what they are starting to look like when they are delivered again, reinforcing that Geauga Transit is not Lake Tran and it is a different service and it's here to stay separately. And so this is sort of their, their fresh new look. Um, I think Joanna said the drivers were excited about it. So we just thought it'd be good for the board to see uh, what they'll look like. But the other thing I'll hit on that Joanna mentioned, but um, these are the local match is supplied by ODOT. So the, there's a federal grant pays for 80%. ODOT is paying the 20% local share with uh, toll revenue credits. That's something they do for rural transit agencies that have a, a not as much local cash. So these are, you know, they're not free necessarily because taxpayers are still paying for them, but there is no direct cost to Geauga Transit uh, or Lake Tran for that matter at all. So they're essentially uh, free to us. <clears throat> I can't recall if it was in a prior meeting uh, discussed or not. Is there uh, refueling at Jugga's headquarters? Uh, there's not uh, propane infrastructure right now. That is on uh, the six month look ahead and is on the future agenda for uh, the installation of a tank and dispenser. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? I do. Uh, ben, this is gonna be done under the, our Tesco contract. Yeah, so we, uh, because we have an existing contract for propane buses, we were able to roll this up underneath it, which made it uh, especially attractive for ODOT since we don't have to go through a procurement process. Does it have any impact on Lake Tran, Lake County, nope. uh, purchasing anything, any additional buses or anything under that? No, we have, a, we have a set number of options in the contract and we have, we always add, add a little bit just in case something happens. And so we're, we're, we're good. Okay. So. When do, when does that contract expire for with Tesco? Is it? Mm, what'd you say? Twenty twenty seven. Twenty twenty seven. Okay. And there's is there a limit to the number of buses you can buy under that contract? Yes, I believe it's eighty. Eighty. Yeah. And I mean, if in, in the event for some reason if we ran out, we would just procure another contract early. Yeah. So it's 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 not that big of an issue. Okay. Great. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve resolution 2023-026 authorizing the CEO or his designee to purchase six replacement Dialeride vehicles from Lake Trans existing agreement with Tesco for Geauga Transit at a cost not to exceed $1,150,000 of Geauga Transit funds? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Swanson. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Zibble. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. Mac, Mac to me? Yes. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. I will now turn the meeting over to Matt to talk about the uh, TripSpark software. Thank you, Bren. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanted to start off with a quick definition 
uh, just because I know I refer to trapeze and trip spark and pass and all sorts of things kind of interchangeably. Trapeze and trip spark are two different companies, but also a uh, Trip Spark is a sister company to Trapeze. Pass is actually the scheduling software that we have currently, but I know that I referred to it as Trapeze before. So I just wanted to do a quick um, update on that real quick. So we have had Trapeze Pass since 1993 for all of our dial -a ride scheduling. Um, we were told um, it was probably around April of this year that we had to do an upgrade. We've, we were scheduled to do an upgrade. They pushed it off and then they were trying, they were trying to force us onto a version of pass that was a little bit newer, which is fine, but it was a different, um, different model. So that pushed us to explore the different options that were out there. Our current version of PASS is going to be retired, so we were looking at it, and one of the things was we had to upgrade the map. Well, that would be around $20,000 to do that upgrade. So we looked at all the different softwares and decided to go with TripSpark Novus. So what TripSpark Novus does for us is it helps because it already integrates with the existing uh, customer facing modules that we have, which is passenger portal notifications. Um, it, it integrates with the current in vehicle technology, as well as any proposed same day dial -a ride software that we go with in the future with rides on demand. So some of the other benefits to switching to Novus. Um, Novus upgrade, uh, they're talking eight to nine months and I'll, I'll have a, a timeline for you a little bit later and I'll tell you some things there with pass. It would be about a year. So it's a quicker upgrade savings of around $63,000 a year in maintenance fees. That's a big deal. Um, same database structure. So we don't lose any of our current data. It also integrates with Google maps. So that creates a much better scheduling algorithm for us rather than relying on a static county GIS map that we have to purchase. And then also K improved KPI dashboard. Um, it has real-time information for dispatchers about on-time performance, passengers per hour, unscheduled per hour, that type of thing to help aid their decisions to make it more efficient. There we go. So earlier I talked about the timeline and them saying eight to nine months. I'm pushing them. I think that eight to nine months for a, a project of this scope is not reasonable. Uh, they have accepted me pushing them and we are talking about a six month deployment. So it will all start with operational review documents that just go over everything that we need it to do. Um, hoping to finish those up in December and then six months for deployment. And we should hopefully be training staff in July of 2024. So the total cost of the project is 119,726, but the local match is 23,945. So obviously not much different from the cost of the map for pass. So is there any questions? Okay. Are there any questions from Matt at this time? I will make a comment if I could. Uh, we saw this at the uh, expo. And, and saw a demo and um, it's sort of hard to frame it because I don't know what's how it's working today. But uh, what I saw looked pretty seamless and uh, pretty good. But that's from somebody who has no idea how it's currently working. <laughs> I 
Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yes. <laughs> so the old software is going to be obsolete or? The version that we're on is going to be sunset. We could upgrade to a newer version of pass, but it would cost us $20,000 for a new map. So whenever we look at that, I look at, I look at how much it's going to cost us with local funding and how much we're going to save in maintenance costs. It's a no brainer for me. I understand, but where's the map come from? Who has to upgrade it? Um, the map is a county GIS map that That's we actually would have to purchase. We have to pay twenty thousand dollars for correct. A yes, county. for because what what trapeze does is they actually go in and they touch each individual street to tell the system what the speed limit is on that street. And if you can go, you know, eastbound, westbound, only eastbound, yeah, that it. type of thing. It's not. We don't pay Lake County for 20000 do we? No. That's what I'm no. getting at. Okay, it's no. not. I'm going to say we better get that GIS map for nothing, for <laughs> God's sakes. Now, they, they actually, they take the county GIS map and they make it into something proprietary. It's Yes. I, I it's, it. it's I a, understand. Yeah, it's not a great. It, it, it gave me the impression we had to pay Lake County twenty grand for the map that already exists. Come on. You know. Oh, no. Any other questions or comments from Matt? Is there a motion to approve resolution 2023-027 authorizing the CEO or his designee to enter into a contract with TripSpark Technologies for the migration of scheduling software at a cost not to exceed $119,726? So moved. Motion made by Ms. Nunnally. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Swanson. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. McDamee? Yes. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. At this time, I will now turn the meeting over to Mr. Dines to uh, discuss the rules and regulations and where he left off with the uh, several documents that were circulated within uh, just over a week ago. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Falkowski. Uh, the board will recall that you've met uh, extensively over the last couple of years and discussed the rules and regulations. Uh, these have now been revised for all board input and comments and with the help of Mr. Zibel. Uh, the original rules were amended and revised in January 2001. That has been included in your packet as well as the revision from February 2023, which really included about six words. Uh, and the revised now currently October 2023. Each of those uh, are its own exhibit uh, pursuant to this motion to approve the resolution of 2023-028 by the board to modify and amend its rules and regulations. As note, these were published a week ahead of time uh, per the rules and regulations requirements, and now they're here for your vote and approval, presuming as you've read those absent any additions, comments, or uh, exclusions otherwise. Uh, at this time, I'd like to open the floor for any discussion or any questions or comments in general or for Mr. Dine specifically. I, I do have one, and it's probably me that's confused. But uh, if you go all the way to the very end, page 13 and uh, section three, this is probably legalese that I don't understand, but um, it says the adoption, modification, or amendment of a rule shall be by two thirds vote of the members of the board present during that voting. And then if you go back to <clears throat> page, on page 10, Article 6, Section 3, no, I'm sorry, Section 1. It says the vote, uh, affirmative vote of a majority of the board members present at any meeting shall be necessary to adopt any resolution or motion or conduct any other business. Don't those two contradict each other? Am I missing something? Well, give me just one second No. Isn't it the rules and regs requires a super majority? Yes. That's what's, uh, thank you. So that is a, just a normal resolution as majority of the board present, but to modify the rules and regulations is a super majority. However, I should probably let Mr. Dines explain no, that one. And I apologize. I was scrolling through. So th he's exactly correct. So okay. this, the, the difference there is this is the rules and regulations as opposed. So the rules and regulations, any modification otherwise is specifically stated within as opposed to a normal quorum or majority. Gotcha. Thank you. I believe the intent of that is just to make it 
so you're not modifying rules on a regular basis or when there's a smaller meeting. It makes sense. Any other? Uh, yes, Ms. McNamee. Page nine. On page nine, fiscal matter contract shall be entered into accordance with the applicable provisions of the Ohio Revised Code. I understand that on one level, but on another level, there are federal regulations for contracts. And we discussed that in some capacity a little bit at length in the last meeting and you'll recall that because the federal rules we wouldn't we wouldn't necessarily be bound by those and in entering into a snowplow agreement for lake trend or otherwise so we have discussed that as a board and the board agreed to remove that that wasn't it that was a proposed addition to make it in compliance with federal obligations or rules but we don't always use federal money which implicates those rules well i'm just wondering if that should be more defined here if, yeah, if you want to give me a minute, I'll pull up. I had a conversation actually with the FTA about that, and, and okay. I'll just pull up a prior draft uh, if you give me a minute, and I can highlight that for you. Okay. Find the one with the actual comment. Give me just a second. blue circle. It's a little bit of a lengthy comment, but I'll, I'll read it to you in case uh, it, it clears anything up. What we recall is there's no correlating statute providing that the FTA governs Ohio transit agencies. FTA provides for a variety of things to transit defined as follows. Administers a national transit safety program and program compliance oversight process. Provides grants to local public transit systems, including buses, subways, light rail, commuter trail, trolleys and ferries, advanced public transportation, et cetera. FTA provides specific, specifically the grantees have a responsibility to comply with statutory and regulatory, regulatory requirements associated with the management of federally funded assisted grants. When I spoke with the Office of Chief Counsel, advised that FTA funds are being used. They don't, if they are not being used, they don't have their fingers in it and they have no desire to, in any way, shape, or form, direct that or have any provision for that. So again, I noted, for instance, consider a contract with a local landscape contractor. If no FTA funds are being used to pay for those services and Lake Tran has no obligation to comply with FTA, ODOT, or anyone else. If each of our agreements with the local contractor had to have FTA language, by America, et cetera, for example, our agreements would be rather cumbersome and include irrelevant and unenforceable language. It may also limit those with whom Lake Tran could contract. So, we had talked about it further, and there was a discussion. Mr. Zibel uh, might recall this a little bit as well. We, we somewhat agree that contracts should be entered into in accordance with applicable provisions of the Ohio Revised Code. And we talked about adding more language about if in the event it was an FTA contract. And I think everyone agreed that was unnecessary and, and decided instead to leave that provision as it stands and has stood. I understand where you're going with this, yet at the same time, well, we all understand it, the people sitting here doing this, looking at this as a document that's going to move forward in the future for board members who we don't even know they who they may or may not be. 
I'm concerned that this suggests that the only thing we have to follow is contracts with applicable provisions of the ORC. And there's no indication here that certain procurements must be followed, or I should say done under, by the FTA's oversight. And I'm not suggesting you go down into the weeds, which whichever thing you read, but perhaps just a simple sentence, something to the effect with the exception of contracts which are overseen by the FTA, some such kind of language, just to indicate that there's a second path here that's very, very important, but for those federal dollars that we do this under the purview of the FTA's regulations. I, I, I would leave it up to you as a board to decide if that's what you want to do. We discussed that in some detail last time and the board decided not to, so I didn't I didn't make that change. And if that's something that you- Well, I think board... actually for me, seeing it in writing in the context here and thinking about it more, it just seems like we should at least point out that there's two paths. That's up to all of you. If you want that language in there, it's it's not required. I think you're limiting yourselves and then you're, you could go down that path further to talk about ODOT, FTA, you could continue going, going, but that's that's up to the board, whatever you prefer to do. Those agreements that I think Andrea would would, you know, would tell you that they come, most of the grants and agreements that are FTA agreements, if, if that's specifically what you're speaking about, or even ODOT, have language requirements in them that we follow and we continue to follow in every single one of those contracts we enter into. But that's that's up to the board. I, I'm, I mean, again, I'm happy to make whatever changes you want. That was one that we specifically discussed and it was agreed not to, but I, I will do whatever you please. Ben and Andrea, please correct me if I'm mistaken on this, but my understanding with it, Donna, was that the ORC lays out a whole bunch of contractual obligations that we have to meet for signing with the contractor. If there's a problem with the contract, this is how you go about doing things and, and so on and so forth with minimum uh, wage standards and things like that. But the grants have some um, requirements that we need to fulfill to receive the grant funds, which have then become requirements for the contractor to do. It has nothing to do with the legal obligation to complete the contract, it's, okay. except from the standpoint that it is part of the construction contract or whatever contract we have that says these are things that you have to do just as it would be for concrete, plow snow or anything like that. It would just be some other requirements. So you're right? distinguishing it that the federal grants create certain obligations as opposed to a contract entered into under the ORC is do I understand that distinguished? I, I think that I think we're on the same page there, yes. Um I'm still wondering if there should shouldn't be some distinguishment distinguishment made. I understand what you're saying, but perhaps the basis of what you're saying somehow needs to be in this document in a sentence. I'm I'm not of that opinion that the FTA, after we've had all the discussions and that, I wasn't of the opinion that uh, the FTA regulations really had any substantial obligation for us to enter into contracts. Ben? I'm I'm personally very comfortable with the way it's written. I think Mr. Dines pointed out one thing that if we go down the road of adding every single little thing that well, becomes a limiting document for lack of a better phrase. I think it's probably, I think Mr. Dines followed the direction and I think he did a nice job with the way it is presented currently. Let me ask another question going off what you just said. Then the procurement process, we have a procurement manual. Yes. Okay. Um, that procurement manual 
should we just address the fact that that procurement manual exists in this document somewhere? Well, remember, these are the rules and regulations for the board. Okay. okay. The procurement manual are rules and regulations for the agency, but the board tells the agency to do and how to follow it. Procurement might be a little bit different sometimes than a contract. This rules and regulations specifies for the board that to the extent the board and or the agency enter into a, a contract, they should follow the statutory provisions to do so. So that's the that's the primary driver of this and it's why I presume it was drafted that way originally and maintained and stayed that way. Because if you're now you're going down a path that probably doesn't make a lot of sense and you're limiting your own action as a board in a variety of ways that don't become necessary and don't become relevant. And I would just caution you that anytime the board would then limit its power and add that language in there that creates a situation where you might not be uh, clear in what action you're taking, that could be a little bit of a problem. And again, I, I mean, I, this was a discussion that we had had, and and which was why I reached out reached out to the chief counsel at FCA, and, and they specifically said, "Hey, if our fingers are," his quote was, "We don't have our fingers in it. We're not worried about it." I mean, they they're worried about dictating our compliance with FTA guidelines to the extent that we're entering into any kind of grant or FTA contract. But so, in essence, we're relying on the senior staff and the CEO of the organization to make that distinguishment that when they go for FTA, that we are following their process for procurement as opposed to a straight contract with a particular vendor with local funds. That we're not really documenting it anywhere for the board, but it is documented in the procurement policy. Correct. If I understood you, yes, that's correct. That exactly. I think the important thing is that that is documented and defined and available to the board to understand. I, I, I guess, but you're not. The rules and regulations provide a directive to the board. They provide rules and regulations by which the board acts. So. Forward. I am satisfied to know that this is well defined in the procurement manual that we've got this documented in such a way that the board does have access. And again, I'm not talking about necessarily all of us. I'm thinking forward in the future. It took us 20 years to get this document updated and amended. So when I read something, I'm looking at it into the future. Will future board members understand what we did here and why we did it? And I, I believe you have answered that because it's defined in another document and that falls under the CEO's responsibilities. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other comments or questions? I have one other comment. Mr. Zebel. Um, I am personally struggling very hard with voting yes on these bylaws from the standpoint that I am not feeling that uh, this board is committed to following those rules and regulations. So I have not yet finally made my final decision, but I am just putting it out there that I'm unsure of really how well this board will follow the rules and regulations. Are there any other comments or questions? And Mr. Dines, just to clarify before we go into a vote, um, Mr. Swanson picked up on the rules and regulations requiring the super majority vote. What type of vote is required for passage of these rules and regulations as proposed under the current rules and regulations? Yeah, you would essentially, um, with two thirds, and I know Mr. Mr. Sheet stepped out. Um, I'm not a mathematician, but I think it would require uh, the vote of of six of you in order to pass that. Now, the interesting point here is you have a vacancy in your board. 
Uh, so because of that, that then negates that one member and takes one away. So you would have essentially five of you because you have an eight member board with a vacancy at the moment. So you would need five people to vote yes for these rules and regulations to be approved. I, I believe that's two thirds. Somebody that's a mathematician like Lisa might but be a better help on that. But don't the regulations say the, the members that are present? Correct. And, and so again, I, I, Dude, there's a difference between the board members and the members present. Right. right. Because right. there's far less here. Both Kim and, and, and Bill are, are absent Dude, along with Laura. Four. I'm okay. sorry. Again, yeah, I don't ask. Math to me is a, is a struggle. So. so it's two thirds of the members. Two thirds of the members present. Yes. So it would be a vote of yes for four would pass the, to revise the rules and regulations. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Oh, you know, I might, it's probably picking the uh, fly out of the pepper, but um, uh, somewhere in here, there's a talk about meetings and, and we take August off. I don't, and, and it says we're going to meet every month. I don't know if that's an issue or not. What we decided on that was, was not to make any changes to that section based upon the fact that we pass by resolution a calendar for the, the next year in January. So that kind of takes care of whatever we want to do with the, um, with the calendar. Thank you. Instead of making the revisions. And Thanks. we could make an argument that we don't need a by month since our by month of this last year resulted in a three to four hour meeting the month after. Okay. Um, any more comments, questions on the rules and regulations? Is there a motion to approve resolution 2023-028 by the Board of Trustees of Lake Tran modifying and amending the rules and regulations for Lake Tran and thereafter adopting the rules and regulations for Lake Tran as modified and amended? And I will read the exhibits just so it's very clear. Exhibit A is the rules and regulations currently approved version approved January 2001. Exhibit B, rules and regulations February 2023. Um, and then Exhibit C was the Rules and Regulations, October 2023, and that is the version that has been proposed for approval today. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Swanson. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Nunnally. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. McDemy? Yes. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We have modified our rules and regulations. Uh, next on the agenda, I will turn the meeting over to Matt for the brief operations report. Thank you, Brian. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. So dial -a ride ridership up 4% from August of last year. Um, I did want to break down the ridership that we added for in the morning and in the evening the extra hours. So in August, we had 442 in the morning trips and 197 trips in the evening. So just breaking down that to try to help give you a visual as to who this is benefiting with those extended hours. Um, local route ridership, uh, we saw year to date, a 25% increase over 2022. And if we just are just comparing August of this year to August of last year, it was a 32% increase. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask you one question really quick. When we look at this graph here, we yes. see dial a ride is going up. Uh, we see local route park and ride every month. It's just, you know, constant. It's never really rebound. Just throwing an idea out there. If the board going into winter in Northeast Ohio said, let's do four months of free park and ride service what would you think that would do to, to the demand um it's a good question um we did do some free service um kind of near the begin or kind of mid pandemic i think a lot of people are still working from home downtown um so i would be curious to see what it would do to the ridership but i think it would increase a little bit i don't know if it would increase substantially back to where it was. Okay. 
and uh, denials are still well below uh, where we were. So doing really well there. Thank you. I will also say that the additional rides on fixed route in August, Matt, Matt mentioned it was 32% increase, but that equals 7,400 rides. It's quite a, a significant increase in trips. Yeah. Please. All right, I will go through this lickety split. Uh, in December, we will talk about the budget for uh, Lake Tran, Geauga, and STS and the capital plan. Uh, we'll have the fuel contract. It's an annual activity. Um, it's part of a joint project that we've been involved in for a long time. No major changes in the process. Um, in December, we'll have the budget on for approval for all those same entities and uh, an org chart update. Um, January, we'll have a landscaping or, or our landscaping uh, project on, on the agenda. This is for all the sites we maintain other than headquarters. Headquarters is done by our facilities team. Uh, we'll also have an EEO or an update to the EEO plan. This is a routine update required by the FTA. Um, this is, uh, Brian, when you asked about the propane infrastructure for Geauga, um, phase one of that will be in uh, January. Uh, the budget is about $250,000. This is also fully funded by a LONO grant and um, the uh, an ODOT local match. So there is no direct match required by Geauga, but this will be to install the tank and the dispensing equipment. Um, we want to get that done as phase one, see if there's any money left over in phase two. And if there is, um, see what kind of detection equipment we may choose to add to the facility. Um, Oh, that's missing a heading. Uh, I do have on here tentatively um, a, a more discussion about additional service. Um, this may go away. This may move. I just thought I'd put it on here as a, as a possible placeholder. Um, we'll kind of see how things shake out. Um, February, we still have no action items, although today in staff meeting, uh, we, we I think we do have one or two, so we probably will have a February meeting. Um, March, we have uh, construction at the Madison Park and Ride. Um, this is a result of new federal CDL training regulations. We just can't fit the course uh, at headquarters anymore. It's not even a result of our construction. It's just they made the course really large. So the only practical place for us to put it is at the Madison Park and Ride. We could fit it at the Mentor Park and Ride, but the Mentor Park and Ride is a lot busier, so it doesn't really make sense to put it there. So we'll essentially close off half the Madison Park and Ride and make it a training area. Um, the construction is to remove some landscape islands and some light poles, which are in the way of being able to do the actual work. Um, in April, we have an update to the PTASP, which is a required update by the FTA we do every year, which is just the public agency, the public transit agency safety plan. I hate that acronym. Um, that's just an annual process for us. Uh, those are, that's everything I have at the moment. Anybody have any questions about any of those things? Okay. Thank you right. very much, Ben. Rolling on in. Um, for the HQ project, everything is going well. Um, the only sort of bump in the road we've had so far is with the heating and uh, boiler system. Um, Gallagher is the subcontractor. They got a little bit behind. Um, they have been working 11-hour days to catch up. Um, they are catching up. Um, we learned of another bump in the road today where some pumps and piping were installed incorrectly, so they are addressing those. Um, it has not affected the overall schedule yet. Um, all it means is that right now we are running off of waste oil for heat instead of natural gas, which we would have been doing anyway. So nothing to worry about yet, but um, in the event it were to slip more, it could cause an issue. But as of right now, um, from what we're hearing, we expect them to catch back up and everything should be fine. But uh, there's quite a maze of pipe in our boiler room now. Um, so... Other than that, everything is going smooth. The project's on schedule. Furniture is scheduled to be delivered December 1st. Um, and we will be moving uh, from the admin area into the new area um, mid-December. The exact date that we're supposed to get an occupancy permit is December 18th, which is the board meeting day. <laughs> so I think we'll probably still be in this room for the December board meeting, but for the January board meeting, we will expect to be in the new training room. So um, that'll be just temporary until this space has been uh finished. Uh, but we will keep following the schedule so far. They keep telling us they're on schedule. They delivered drywall today. So uh, moving along. Uh, strategic plan following up, follow up. So um, we heard about uh, same day dial ride today. 
So that's kind of, to me, that's priority number one. Um, the other three services are kind of on the back burner at the moment. And we'll see kind of how those shake out over time. But I know, at least for me, I wanted to prioritize one and really get one in front of the board quickly. We're working on the data for the others, but, you know, listening to the board and in staff meeting and for myself, same day dollar ride really rises above uh, the other three. Um, we did meet as a staff to discuss specifications on three of the four placement vehicles for STS. Uh, the discussion was about the dialer ride style vehicles, but which are larger. Um, we are targeting a capacity of about 33 people. Um, just for reference, an MCI seats 49. So these are smaller than an MCI. Um, we will have, uh, I didn't have this on the six month look ahead because we aren't sure what month we're going to put it in. It'll probably be in February uh, where we ask the board to approve uh, the purchase of those. Ben. Yes, sir. This, the uh, STS, um, you're yeah. talking about new vehicles. I thought one of the things that STS was was going to be used for is to take the older buses that we have and push them over to STS. It wouldn't cost us anything. Whatever happened to that? Yeah, the uh, so we did that with the current MCIs. The, the problem is they only get replaced every 12 years. And so they aren't slated to be replaced again until 2032. And so the buses we have just won't last another almost 10 years. So uh, if we want to keep the service kind of like we talked about at the retreat, it really makes sense from a, a cost effectiveness standpoint to purchase new vehicles for the service. Don't we have other, other buses that are going to be uh, end of life, so to speak? Um, we do, but they're all dial -a ride sized. So they're all a maximum of 12, uh, 12 passengers. So they really aren't big enough for what we do with STS. Um, but there is one dial -a ride size vehicle in the fleet that will continue to be replaced with old dial -a ride buses. It just, the larger buses, we just don't have the replacement schedule just doesn't facilitate their, uh, them being accessible regularly. Thank you. Um, so IT strategic plan follow-up. Um, we spent a lot of time internally reviewing the plan, talking about it and seeing, you know, how we wanted to move forward with it. Um, the consultants were very aggressive with all the projects they listed. Um, we don't really think the total number of projects they have listed are what we want to move forward with. Um, one of the things we talked about a little bit uh, earlier today is the, the two positions. Um, also the transition to Novus, which is a good thing. And, and really what we looked at when, when we looked at next year and sort of our immediate IT future um, one of the biggest hot buttons for us is the implementation of a new HRIS system. We don't have one now. Everything is done on paper. It, there's a lot of cumbersome processes that a modern company would have automated in software. Um, that's a big, uh, sort of a big item for us. Um, hoping for some same day dial ride software uh, later in the year. And, and we're going to continue to look at the plan and see what we can pick and choose out of it. But again, you know, I think the consultants would have preferred us to take, just do every project in the plan on the schedule they suggested. Their schedule was very aggressive, and I'm not sure that every single thing that's in it is really required at this time. It may have to be done over time, but, but, but it was a lot of work up front. Um, we have a new partnership with Juvenile Court. Uh, we recently met with uh, Judge DeLeon to discuss transportation assistance for juveniles. Um, one of his big pushes is that uh, the reason kids get in trouble is they don't have enough to do. And so um, he wants to partner with us to make sure that kids that are in an at-risk category have access to transportation to get them to extracurricular activities to prevent them becoming uh, repeat offenders. So it's actually a really cool program. I, you know, we have to commend him for, for wanting to, to do this with the whole goal being to keep kids from ending up, uh, in his words, across the street, but at the, uh, the main jail. Um, and then uh, hiring uh, on December or on October 2nd, we got uh, welcome 20 new part-time drivers um, that we recruited at the Auburn Career Center. They uh, start on uh, November 13th and we're still struggling to hire mechanics. Um, we have been posting the jobs pretty aggressively on Facebook, on Indeed and all those places. And we are, we had one new applicant recently, but we are having a hard time finding mechanics. So, um, not unlike the rest of the world, it's a difficult job to fill, um, especially for second shift, but it hasn't caused a problem yet. It's been on the border of causing a problem a couple of times. 
So just want to let the board know, you know, it's something we're working on. So you may see more ads from us about mechanics. Um, if you know anybody who wants to have a great job as a mechanic, let us know. <laughs> um, and then the grant tracker, um, the grant tracker is updated in your packet. It is sort of grant season is sort of winding down. There is a lot of stuff uh, that has changed over here over time. Um, one specific one I want to call your attention to is in the Giaga list, um, which is, I forget where it is on the list exactly, but um, we are applying for a workforce development grant. Um, in Geauga County, there are a number of factories in the middle field area that struggle to get employees. And um, we've been working with Geauga Transit and their elected officials to put together a grant that would improve access, especially for the Amish to get to work down in the uh, middle field area. So you've heard a lot from me tonight. Unless you have any questions, that is my report. Thank you, Ben. Any questions or comments for Ben? Seeing none. Um, we will now go to the old business section. I will prov pro provide an update here on legal counsel. Uh, we left off the last meeting that it was a uh, task to me to obtain an opinion on the uh, hiring of legal counsel. Does it need to go through our procurement manual or is the ORC sufficient? Uh, I have made contact with an attorney that is not affiliated with Lake Tran, either Brandon's firm or my firm, uh, who will be providing that opinion, and they will be um, at the next board meeting. They will have a written opinion that I will be circulating ahead of the meeting when they have the chance to do that, and then uh, they will be at the meeting for any questions that anyone may have on the topic. And uh, at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Dines for a sales tax update and discussion. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just as an update, I've had some discussions uh, pursuant to some, some concerns and some questions, and I think there may be some updated guidance. I, I don't have any answers yet, but um, some of the issues and concerns with the guidance we received before from the Department of Taxation and otherwise. So we are just firming up the opinion there, if you will, uh, to have some answer for you. I expect to have something to the board next month uh, that further discusses that issue. And that's really all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other old business in the room at this time? Seeing none, uh, moving on to the new business section. Uh, as we all know, unfortunately, uh, Trustee Laura Pijmo uh, did pass away and I had the opportunity to go to her uh, calling hours and it was just, uh, it, it was very moving. It was just unbelievable the amount of people there. Um, it was a wonderful tribute to Laura. Um, in doing such, the agency has prepared a proclamation to um, honor Laura Pijmo as well. Uh, and at this time, uh, do we need to have a motion for anything like this? What's the proper course of action? You're looking at me. I think you should also look at Brandon. <laughs> I, <don't laughs> I think I, I think a motion would be appropriate. Absolutely. Uh, at this time, is there a motion to approve uh, the proclamation proclamation honoring Laura Pijmo for her service as a Lake Tran trustee? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Zibble. Is there a second? Uh, well, there's a lot to read here, Donna. It's uh, reciting that she started on the board in July. Do you I'm sorry. To... It's also me... been in Govenda. You want me to read it? I can read it. If you if you want to read it, you're more than welcome to. Do you want me to? Whereas Lake Trans Board of Trustees is a nine-member governing body responsible for the general oversight of Lake County, uh, Lake County's regional public transit system, and whereas Laura Pijma was appointed to the Lake Trans Board of Trustees in July of 2022, uh, as she went on ensuring Lake Trans continues to meet the needs of Lake County seniors, families, and employees now and for many years. Whereas Laura Pijmo generously shared her vision and talents as an assisting prosecuting attorney for Ashtabula County and former Willoughby Hills Council member and an active volunteer serving in many nonprofit boards. Whereas Laura Pijmo honor, or served honorably offering expertise in government relations and strategic planning while building trust and leadership critical for the Lake Train headquarters expansion building project and excellent in fiscal management safeguarding the agency's funding today and into the future. Whereas Laura Pijmo always remained humble in her acts of service and accomplishments that have benefited many, resident, yeah, many residents throughout Lake County. 
Therefore, be it proclaimed that we, Brian J. Falkowski, as president of the Lake Tran Board of Trustees and Ben Cabell as CEO of Lake Tran, together with the Lake Tran Board of Trustees and employees of Lake Tran, proclaim an honor and an appreciation on October 23rd, 2023 in Lake County, Ohio, to the to the leadership and volunteer commitments of Laura Pijmo that served Lake Tran and the residents of Lake County. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Zibelfin made a motion. Was there a second? Seconded by Ms. Nunnally. Uh, Trudy, could you please call the roll? McNamee? Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibel? Yes. Okay. Is there any other new business in the room? Seeing none, at this time is our motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion made by Ms. Nunnally, seconded by Ms. McNamee. Trudy, if you could please call the roll. McNamee? Yes. Nunley? Yes. Sheets? Yes. Swanson? Yes. Zibble? Yes. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned at 623 today.